everybody. Uh, I'm Hal Katz, a partner in Hush Blackwell's healthcare practice. Welcome to the fifth webinar in our eight part health law and innovation series. Before we begin, I'll go over a few housekeeping items. First, at the bottom of your audience console, there are multiple application icons for your use during the program today. Second, if you have any questions during the session, please submit them via the question box at the bottom. We will try and answer all questions during the session, but if a fuller answer is needed or we run out of time at the end to answer, we will make sure we will follow up via email with answers to all questions. Uh, next, a PDF of the presentation is available in the resources folder. Also, this session has been approved for continuing legal education. To report your hours, click on the CEU icon at the bottom of the screen, and you'll get a certificate emailed to you tomorrow, along with a recording of our webcast for watching as well as sharing. Lastly, toward the end of the session, we have a short survey we hope you'll uh, fill out. Uh, your feedback is very valuable for us and we use it in all of our programming and want to make sure we incorporate your thoughts and your requests in our future programming. So that's it for our housekeeping items. Um, let's go ahead and get started with our session. Uh, we are excited to have you join us today for our discussion on the pandemic and how the pandemic, I should say, is impacting buying selling and investing in the healthcare space. And we uh, are uh, pleased to have uh, a panel of speakers uh, joining us. Uh, I will be moderating our panel today and we have my law partner, Kirsten Salzman. She's the leader of the firm's corporate and securities, corporate and governance teams. She provides um, strategic advice, transaction, uh, support uh, leading M&A teams on deals across the country, uh, and she is actively involved de in deals currently uh, during um, uh, our COVID crisis. Uh, next, we have Steve Aguiar, who is an investment banker and managing director at Co Coker Capital. Uh, he has 15 years of healthcare experience uh, in investment banking. Uh, specifically in the healthcare space uh, and across all sectors. He, he, he brings a wealth of knowledge uh, from service provider to digital health, uh, be it physician practice management, um, retail healthcare, facility, pharma, uh, you name it, he's, he's got great experience. Next, um, Chris Mullet. Uh, Chris is currently System Executive Vice President and General Counsel. Uh, to Edward Elmhurst Health, which I believe is um, Illinois' largest, largest integrated health system. Uh, and he is responsible for providing uh, system and legal advice on a wide variety of legal matters. Uh, he's also responsible for overseeing the system risk management, claims management, and, and many other areas within the system. So we're, we're lucky to have uh, our, our panel members uh, and we appreciate them uh, taking time uh, to share their, their knowledge and, uh, and, and what they're seeing uh, across the country. Before we get started, um, we find it uh, very helpful and interesting both to, to us uh, and, and hopefully to you uh, on who's participating on our, on our discussion today or in our discussion today. So we have a, a short set of questions we'd love uh, for you guys to respond to. Uh, I'll read them and give you a little time to respond. The first question is, what sector of healthcare do you work within or represent? I'll give you a little bit of time to respond. And there are responses. Next, in a purchase, sale, or an investment, which most aligns with your perspective? Okay, 
thank you everyone for answering that question. Next, are you currently participating in a transaction or planning to participate in a transaction within the next nine months? Okay, very, very helpful. All right, well, um, we are now ready to kick off our um, discussion. And wow, I, you know, what a year. Um, Steve, maybe I'll start with you. Uh, 2019 was, was a, a great year, a busy year when it, when it came to buying, selling, and investing. And while it was just uh, in January, uh, JP Morgan Healthcare Conference um, week uh, seems so long ago. Um, but to help set the stage and to provide some context, maybe you can share with us, um, you know, where we were coming into 2019. I, I remember at, at JPM um, a lot of excitement, um, a lot of momentum, um, and frankly, a lot of competition for uh, for investing or, or buying opportunities uh, from the investor. Excuse me, from the investment banker's perspective. Uh, maybe you can share with us um, your perspectives. Sure. Thanks, Hal. It's hard to believe that this is still in the same year as, as JP Morgan. It feels like you know there's going to be two different realms of time, you know, pre-COVID and post-COVID. And you know, going into 2020 and JP Morgan, which is in January of every year, it's always a good lit litmus test for what people are expecting over the year. And we're, we're, we were coming off you know 10 or 11 sort of expansionary years with with record high fundraising from a private equity perspective, record high deal making, and just a lot of interest across the board within healthcare and other industries as well. And you know, through you know, JP Morgan, there was a lot of energy and excitement about the businesses that were planning to come to market. We as a firm had brought three or four different management teams to meet with investors with, with some early, looks meeting, early look meetings over that time. And all those meetings were very well received and, and, and you know, we fully expect it to be going live with it with several transactions come March and, and obviously COVID hit and put a lot of those processes on hold. But the excitement was was at an all time high. I, I think uh, in a lot of ways, JP Morgan felt like Groundhog Day because everybody was waiting for, you know, a contractionary period with, within the, within the economy because the valuations just kept going up and up and up and, and people kept fundraising and deals were getting done. And as you said, competition across the board, comp competition to win deals from a buyer perspective, competition to win deals from an advisory perspective. The deal environment was just at a, a, at a chaotic pace year over year, and, and nothing had changed at the beginning of this year. Thank you, Steve. Chris, Chris, how about from the hospital's perspective, um, both from looking at um, the acquisition of other facilities, uh, but also uh, acquiring other healthcare businesses, be it physician practices or, or ancillary businesses that support the, the, the healthcare space. Yeah, good morning or good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you, Hal. First, a correction. Um, when you introduced me, you, I think you indicated uh, Edward Elmer's Health is uh, the largest integrated health system in the metro area. We might wish to be so, but we're not. Uh, we are one of the larger integrated health systems in the Chicago metro area. Um, obviously, uh, for the first quarter of, of the calendar year, um, I think we, like so many other hospitals all over the country, were consumed with um, responding to the, the pandemic. And uh, many of us were spending a lot of our time really trying to do everything possible to procure um, you know, necessary uh, supplies and, and personal protective equipment and the like in, in a market that suddenly kind of crashed and made those very hard to, to uh, procure. However, um, I think even in the first quarter of the calendar year, there was still a fair amount of merger and acquisition activity that was going on in the not-for-profit tax exempt hospital system, which is what Edward Elmhurst is, is uh, a part of. Um, although, as I said, COVID became a, a rather large distraction for uh, many of us. I, I think there was an expectation 
that the pandemic would cause a slowdown of that activity heading into the second quarter of the calendar year, but uh, the data would suggest that that, in fact, hasn't been the case, that the activity has remained relatively uh, stable. And when I'm talking about these transactions, I'm talking about hospital system to system consolidations and affiliations. Uh, to your specific question, Hal, um, even with all that was going on with COVID, we were still very much uh, actively pursuing uh, physician practice acquisitions and evaluating other uh, potential joint venture opportunities in such areas as surgery centers and uh, ambulatory uh, locations. Thank you, Chris. Well, Kirsten, uh, going into the year again, pre-COVID, what you know? What was your main focus? What where where were things from from your perspective as you were representing your healthcare industry clients in M and A activity? Christian, you may be muted if you're still with us. I'm here. Sorry about that. Um, okay. I'm, um, Building off a little bit of what Steve said earlier, um, you know, at the beginning, at the end of 19, beginning of 20, um, I found the, the market to be extremely frothy. I mean, everybody was trying to get deals done. Um, most of them were focused on strategic growth. Everybody was looking for ways to capture market share or to, um, to just grow their revenues. Um, I was working on a number of interesting transactions. Um, as, as Chris mentioned, we were working on a, a, a representing some hospitals on acquisitions of large physician practice groups, representing um, nonprofit hospitals, venturing into um, doing ventures with uh, for-profit institutions. Um, it, it was all over the board, and it was, it was an exciting time. It was one of those times where you didn't quite know how you were going to get everything done th th that day. Um, and um, I, you know, I found that, that people were very strategic. They were very forward looking. They were very willing to take calculated risks. Um, you know, a lot of since then, I've seen people back off a little bit from that. But it was just an exciting time. And I think, as as Steve mentioned, everybody was kind of waiting for a downturn because it'd been so long. I kept saying I haven't seen things this busy since 2007, which made me nervous. Um, but um, Nobody knew that this would, would be what was the slowdown is, is a virus. Uh, I think people thought more it would be a crack in the financial market. But it, it, was, a, it was an exciting, fun time. And it still is, as, as Chris mentioned, but at a different pace. So, okay. Well, Steve, I know you've got uh, a couple of charts that you'd like to, to uh, reference or that you've shared with us to help illustrate what's been happening. Uh, during uh, COVID-19. Uh, anything else you want to highlight there on this chart before I move us to the next one? Yeah, I think, you know, if you if you take a look at the, the trend lines here, what, what's interesting is most people generally are interested in healthcare because it ends up being, you know, historically speaking, it's been recession resistant. But what you see in the sort of the bottom half of this chart is that healthcare services specifically perform, underperform the general market through the lockdown period. And a lot of that is being driven by statewide restrictions on elective procedures and volumes. And, and um, you know, since those have, uh, a lot of those restrictions have lifted, at least for now and hopefully forever, um, you know, the, the markets have, have bounced back and, and, and deal volume has bounced back. And if you look at the top, of the chart, you know, we're, we're certainly down, you know, about a third from where we were last year, a little bit more on an annualized basis. Generally speaking, you know, we think, you know, we'll probably make up some of that margin in Q4 as, as people are concerned about potential tax changes with a with change in the White House. And so um, the, the, the sort of cadence at which deals are getting done right now is certainly picking up after the 4th of July when, when, the, when the economy and the country began to open back up. And then on our next slide, uh, you want to walk us through what we see here? 
Sure. Um, just taking a look at both the total market on the left side and in the in the healthcare M and A market on the right side, we're certainly down year over year um, in both cases. Um, and a lot of what happens is that the M and A market sort of follows the public market. And so as um, you know, the public market got hit extremely hard. The lending market, you know, closed up or was was very fragile for for some time. Uh, you know, March, April, and May. Um, or challenging months to, to get deals done, and people were just trying to stay afloat. And a lot of these, these businesses were supported and, and buoyed by a lot of the SBA programs that came out. And, and you know, as, as I mentioned before, as the world started opening back up, even though cases continued to, to go up into July, people began to get more comfortable with the diagnostics, therapeutics, uh, leveraging telemedicine, and, and really figuring out a way to, to operate in this new environment. And that's led to, uh, you know, additional transactions uh, happening sort of starting in Q3 and, and into Q4. And Steve, with a little bit of a roller coaster ride that we've been on <clears throat> in the last oh, couple of months here, uh, sliding into the end of the year and looking into that first quarter, um, what, what do you see, uh, where do you see us going, uh, you know, from, um, certain uh, industry sectors, be it uh, professional services, uh, digital health, uh, and you know, throw in uh, buyers more eager to sell. Um, maybe buyers looking advantage, uh, looking to take advantage of um, a, a seller's. Um, I'm sorry, a seller willing to sell or eager to sell. Um, what are your thoughts there? I think you know. I think we've all seen how the Nasdaq's performed. You know, anything digital health related is a, is really hot right now, and the valuations that are at all time high. And you've seen the the sort of penetration of of, of telehealth and those types of tools and, and virtual disease management. Um, you know, this 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 pandemic has really um, you know moved those to the forefront. Whereas the technology has been there and the tools have been there, but reimbursement's been lack been lagging behind and. And with uh, with the need for those types of services, that that certainly got to the forefront. So I think digital health is here to stay, and, and all this transformative technology is here to stay across the healthcare industry. You know, it's uh, it's taken a long time. Uh, you know, you can remember Athena Health being the first sort of uh, SaaS based service, and, and now we have a lot more uh, digital tools uh, in comparison to other industries that are that feel like they're ten to twenty years ahead of us in the utilization of that. On the provider side, I think it's a different it's a different world. Uh, you know, depending on where these providers are geographically, um, the you know physician groups and, and providers, I would say, in the south and in in, in places outside the northeast, uh, the groups that have returned to pre-COVID levels are are in a good position. And there's a lot of uh, you know there's a lot of platforms out there that have private equity dollars behind them or public public dollars behind them that are in, in hospitals that are trying to you know, acquire them or partner with these groups. And, you know, we've closed two physician practice deals in the past three weeks, and we have several more to close in the next, over the next four weeks. And those deals were mostly in process, you know, pre-COVID. And, and, and once those groups have hit their pre-COVID volume levels, we were able to, to get back to, uh, to, to the playing field and, and meeting with buyers and, and moving towards a, a closing of the deal. I think it's the it's the physician practices, it's the provider groups that are in, you know, the states that were extremely um, impacted by COVID in the early days, Connecticut, New York, and some of the Northeast states, where they're just not back to where they were from a volume perspective. They really have struggled um, to, to sort of um, get to a, a sort of a, a mature level where they were before. So I would expect the, the premier groups up in that region, uh, you know, are probably on hold from, from a sales perspective. But that also creates opportunity for the buying community, where a lot of groups are not going to be able to survive. Uh, a lot of a lot of practices don't have good sort of capital markets relationships to be able to weather the storm from a from a cash flow perspective, and that creates opportunity for buyers to come step in and and, and, and partner with them and provide them the lifeline they need. And so I think it's really dependent on the industry, the subsector, and the geography, and depending on where you fall within sort of that spectrum. It could be a really attractive time to sell your business, or you know, you might be on hold for a while, or you're going to be forced to sell your business because you're not going to survive. Chris, how are things uh, changing, if at all, from the the hospital perspective? I think you alluded uh, to uh, activities, activity 
continuing uh, on uh, for your system, um, but are you making any uh, changes to your, your strategy or your priorities in light of COVID and how that's impacting facilities and other providers and businesses in your community? Yeah, thank you, Hal. I, I, <clears throat> there's no doubt that COVID has been a transformational shock to the entire system. Um, and so, you know, the for example, to, to Steve's point, we, um, I think, I think one of the things that's changed for us is that the competition and the character of the competition for physician practices um, has has changed rather significantly. So the the entry of private equity into this space in a much more significant and aggressive way is different now than it was pre-COVID or, or certainly in the years, the, the, the 24 months, let's say, leading up to uh, pre-COVID. Um, so that that is a new uh, issue for us to have to contend with. Um, at the same time, you know, I think many of you may be familiar with uh, Kaufman Hall. It publishes uh, data on, on uh, hospitals across the entire United States and M&A activity as well. Um, you know, so EBITDA margins were, were down dramatically uh, year over year in April um, because many of us had to shut down all of our elective procedures, which are our most profitable um, um, service lines. Uh, and so EBITDA was down in a significant way. Uh, we were fortunate when things open up again to get our bond back fairly quickly, although they are still not where they were uh, at the COVID level. Um, so our EBITDA margins are still down. Um, but <clears throat> I think that uh, one thing the pandemic has absolutely demonstrated for all of us is there probably are some significant advantages to be uh, obtained from scale. Uh, I'll give you an example. Um, one of the things that I think we in, in the hospital industry have worked on for years and years and years uh, with respect to inventory management has been the, the concept of just-in-time inventory because we have a lot of dollars tied up in our inventory. And so uh, it's, it's expensive to keep large amounts of inventory. And then when COVID hit, uh, that strategy became one that obviously wasn't a good one for us to, do, to to be able to respond effectively to the pandemic. So, to, so now we're having to think about that in a very different way. Uh, and we're having to do what many other organizations are doing as well, try to figure out how we can stockpile this and what is the right amount to keep you know, on hand, what is the par level, if you will. Uh, and, and in that regard, I think um, uh, scale and size probably gives uh, organizations an advantage in being able to respond to that. Uh, innovation has become a huge issue for us in the healthcare industry, and um, that's something that's that's new in a very different way and how we, how we can enter that space in an effective way. And then uh, to the point that was made about uh, telehealth and digital services, um, our entire way of delivering care and providing access points to care is uh, changing radically, and we we have to be able to respond to that effectively, while at the same time recognizing the fact that we've made and have huge investments in brick and mortar facilities, which isn't necessarily going to be the ideal state for us uh, over the long term. Thank you, Chris. Um, why, don't, why don't we move to a discussion on valuation and, and how COVID is impacting uh, valuation and, and the financial terms uh, uh, more specifically. Steve, we've got um, you know purchase price. We we've got uh, rollover and earnouts. Um, how how do you see COVID impacting those? Uh, major business terms, financial terms? Sure. You know, so similar to what I was mentioning earlier, for the businesses that, that we've been working with and that we've, you know, we're familiar with, to the extent that you can prove that you're back to sort of pre-COVID volume levels, 
uh, we've been we've seen the, the buyer community be willing to accept adjustments made to the COVID period that sort of normalize the the profitability of 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 the company for that period as if COVID, you know, what didn't force you to shut down and so sort of smooth out the earnings to have to, to be more sort of linear to what the performance should look like given how you perform sort of post lockdown and um, to the extent that that's true and 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 it's not. Uh, viewed as sort of a, a pent up demand where patients couldn't get in and all of a sudden you see a spike of 120% of, of previous visits because everybody needs needs to go to the dermatologist or the ophthalmologist. And so it's sort of teasing through what's what's sustainable, uh, durable earnings of the business. Um, you know, we've seen sort of full purchase prices be paid that we're at the same levels as, as, as pre-COVID and, and, you know, adjustments to EBITDA to reflect what the earnings would have been without being in a lockdown. And so for the businesses that are fortunate enough to, to be in an area where they're back to quote unquote normal, um, you know, we're still see, we're seeing the same terms that we saw earlier in the year. And the lending markets are, you know, not as, you know, there's not as much leverage available, slightly less le leverage available, maybe a little more pricey, but given all the equity capital that that's been raised over the past couple of years, groups are willing to over equitize the deal to, to win a deal. And so, um, you know, some groups find themselves in that position. Other groups where they may not be all the way back, we're seeing, you know, the idea of, of earnouts and holdbacks that are tied, that might be tied to sort of the volume levels of, of, of sort of pre-COVID, where, whereby if these groups want to transact and, and there could be tax reasons this year or strategic reasons, then, you know, you, you include some sort of provision in the deal where they can earn back what they believe they were worth pre-COVID, um, assuming that they, they get back to that to that normal level. So maybe more focus on, on earn out uh, uh, to help with some back-end correction, uh, but also some holdback uh, to protect the, the buyer. Um, those, those terms seem to be more aggressively uh, negotiated or, or negotiated in a way uh, that's new based on COVID. Yeah, I think we always start with what what is our client looking to achieve, and if if they if they don't need to transact and they're not back to pre-COVID levels, then oftentimes our advice is to wait until you know we feel like you're you're back to you know, a reasonable, sustainable level. If you don't want to take the risk of of an earnout or hold back, because those are you know there's there's some risk in, in in entering into a new arrangement and making sure that people like yourself can can structure that properly. But you know a, a lot of times clients want you know the cash up front, and 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 depending on 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 what their goals are, you know it's oftentimes our advice to wait. But if they if they want to transact and they like the the uh, the spirit of partnerships that that's in front of them, then I think you're seeing a lot more earnouts and holdbacks to help bridge that gap, and it's taking concessions on both the buyer and the seller to get comfortable with with the deal, just given the the, the impact of of COVID. Chris, uh, being a health system. Uh especially when it comes to uh, the acquisition of physician practices, um, Stark is always uh, a, 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 a significant regulatory issue that has to be addressed in, in the anti-kickback statute as well. Um, with the, the executive order and waivers and trying to come up with fair market value for the purchase price and other uh, financial terms, um, how's the hospital approaching valuation well, I, I honestly, I found Steve's comments uh, interesting because uh, we, I think, have seen essentially very much the similar, uh, very much a similar uh, um, perspective on the part of valuation firms as well as on the um, physician groups that are interested in talking to us in that uh, to the extent that they appear to have come back to uh, or pretty close to their pre-COVID levels. The valuations are are doing exactly as Steve said. They're 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 in some ways treating the valuation as though COVID had had never really occurred or didn't have that significant an impact. And they are normalizing those earnings when we uh, are looking at a valuation of a physician practice. Um, so. Um, I, honestly, it's not that different than it was uh, pre-COVID at, at, at this point in time in, in our experience for potential opportunities to acquire practices. 
And Chris, you're, you're not um, relying on any of the executive orders or uh, waivers to get you more comfortable with the system, more comfortable with an acquisition uh, during COVID because of the impact uh, of its uh, 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 the impact on its business, on the seller's business. Um, you're you're still relying on traditional valuation uh, approaches. Um, and decision making, it sounds like. Yes, we are. Um, I, certainly, there are other um, there are other waivers that we've relied on uh, mm -hmm. as part of uh, the response to COVID. But when it comes to position practice acquisitions, we have, for the most part, really pretty much stayed the course. Thanks, Chris. So, Kirsten, uh, we've got uh, what we refer to as the force majeure provision. Uh, often included in these purchase agreements. And historically, um, not a lot of time was spent um, looking at those provisions. Um, now with, with COVID, um, they're getting a lot of attention. Um, the provision that says uh, the parties may be released from uh, some of their obligations uh, in the event of a pandemic. Um, and you know that, that is potentially protection for the buyer, but also the seller, um, uh, especially around earnouts um, and in other financial terms. Can you talk about how you're dealing with the force majeure provision in, in negotiations? Yeah, I mean the the force majeure, the map clause in in situations where um, there's a, a sign and simultaneous close. You know, people didn't spend a lot of time focusing in on that, quite honestly, in the past because there wasn't a real um, incentive or need to. Everybody just assumed the transaction would close or or, or go forward. And so I, I'm finding that, that that more time is being spent on those. Um, People are being realistic and I think um, reasonable in their approach to it, um, recognizing that, that that there are real things. I mean, in, until probably COVID, nobody had had an almost nationwide stop to the economy or a, or a problem. And, and now that they're, they're, that's a reality now. And, and w will there be a second wave? And how will that affect the transaction? And and and, and so even some of the, the civil unrest, people are really recognizing that and really willing to focus in on it. Um, so yeah, it's, it's definitely become more of a focus. And how about the, the holdback provisions uh, in the the earnouts, are are you um, dealing with new negotiating um, strategies or or uh, uh, issues when it when it comes to those terms? Yeah, I don't know if they're necessarily new or unique. I mean, pre-COVID 2019, first quarter of 2020, you really weren't talking about a lot of earn out or hold back because everybody cash was king and people were wanting to get deals done. So now you're really looking back at, you know, trying to, to bridge those valuation gaps that happen. And so you're, you're focusing a lot on, on EBITDA. Um, what will the EBITDA be? What will the adjustments to the EBITDA be? How will it be measured? Um, some of the more traditional things that you, you we've gone back to to the way things were, um, you know, prior to the the last ramp up in deals where where cash was being delivered. But we are spending, um, and in some things, I'll be honest, some are, are rather unique. I've I've had. Um, um, not in the healthcare space, but but in a, in a in a separate space, us negotiating over margins and and having an EBITDA or having an earnout based on on. Um, on the ability to achieve certain margins, which which is unusual, um, in terms of holdback, in terms of uh, escrow holdback and indemnification holdback provisions, um, you know, again, we're seeing those return more to market and people becoming more um, conservative. Uh, before, I think people were willing to buy. Um, they were anxious to get deals done, so they were willing to cut back the amount that they'd be willing to, to require to be held back on deals. And, and now you're getting to see those to be more at a traditional market level. So there's been a lot of level setting in some economic deal terms since since the COVID transaction. People are still doing deals and people are still focused, but I think there's been more level setting. I've got a question uh, from someone from the audience around 
uh, timing and process. And maybe we'll start with Steve. Steve, um, traditionally, a, a, a bidding process is is not uncommon uh, with private equity. Uh, is that still just as um, uh, active? Uh, and is it the sa same timeline during COVID as it was pre-COVID, the bidding process? Yeah, I mean, we, we try to, you know, craft the, the processes based on, you know, what our clients are looking to achieve. I think with the use of Zoom and, and other video conferences, we tend to give the buyer and investor community a little more access to management up front digitally because it's not scheduling and, and flights and dinners and, and what have you. So we end up trying to get the, the, the buyer community uh, a little more comfortable with the deal prior to the first round bids and, and spending a lot more time using, using video conferences and, and, and trying to minimize the time together in person to, to get a deal across the finish line. And so it, it ends up, you know, probably taking the same amount of time. It's just the, the, the periods of time where you would, you would have historically not necessarily given the, the buyer community access to management. You're now giving them some access to management to get them more comfortable upfront because of the, you know, the restrictions on travel and, and, and desire to not, to not be in the same room together um, as much as possible. So that gets us uh, through the, the LOI and, and having a signed LOI. Uh, are, we, are we trying, are, are people being more aggressive in the time to close and the due diligence process, trying to get it all done uh, in a shorter period of time or how's that changing? Yeah. It's hard to tease out what what exactly is 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 driving the the timelines because we're you know because of the pending election on Tuesday a lot of people are concerned about an increase in, in capital gains rates and, and so throwing all the resources possible at, at getting deals done at the end of the year is very much sort of uh, the flavor of transactions right now and so you know you can do sort of site tours via Zoom you can do a lot of this work and so running multiple diligence streams in parallel you know, it's easier, uh, you know, because of the environment we find ourselves in. And a lot of this is being done uh, electro electronically, but you try, but you know, there's not, I haven't worked on any, any deals where the buyer is going to buy the business without ever meeting the seller. And so it's getting to a point that they're comfortable to get into a room and, and, and move forward. And so that could be ultimately the holdup of, of getting a, a, a transaction closed. Chris, how is, how is the, the deal process different for the hospital or is it? Well, I, I think <clears throat> there's no doubt that uh, having to resort to this method of, of, of interacting with uh, uh, parties is, has radically changed our traditional approach to uh, looking at transaction. Um, as, as you all know, and I think many of the people who are listening on this webinar know, in the not-for-profit hospital health system world, typically those are those transactions where systems are coming together do not involve the uh, payment of, of cash consideration for those those transactions. They are, you know, member substitutions, and there may be a, some various forms of commitments made to uh, to capital spend over X number of years following the closing, things of that nature. Um, but in, you know, I guess I'm, I'm showing my age now. I, I think there's no substitute for, um, actual interpersonal interaction not done via a camera. So he, in, in the hospital world, I think there still is absolutely uh, points in time where it becomes an imperative really for people to actually get in a room and meet with each other, socially distance and with masks. Uh, but uh, I, I still think that's something that has to happen. And for us uh, and for other organizations like us, it's not just management. It's, uh, it's very important that our, our board members who are you know, often uh, significant and influential members of the community and that we serve uh, also have to get in a room eventually and, and meet with uh, governance from from the other party. So um, <clears throat> while yes, we still are doing a lot uh, virtually and digitally, uh, in the end, we still have to find a, a way, I think, to 
have those in-person meetings. Thank you, Chris. So Kirsten, we, we uh, were uh, uh, very frustrated with the PPP loan, um, uh, or I should say lack of PPP, PPP loan guidance from the SBA, and that was a gating item for many of our deals, uh, keeping us from keeping us from closing uh, quickly or when the parties are ready. Uh, now we have the SBA guidance, uh, uh, but we're still uh, teasing that out, what it means, and the, the banks are too. How is that impacting closing and the timing, the overall timing of deals? Um, you know what, it, 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 it's, I, I would say overall it's accelerating it because people were trying to figure out how to do a deal when there was a PPP loan outstanding. Would SBA approval be needed to do the transaction? Would the bank allow it to happen? And at the beginning of October, the SBA came out with this guidance that, that really set forth a, a roadmap on how to get a deal done. Um, and basically what they're, the, the key component of that, if you wanna get a deal done without SBA approval, which they've told you will take 30 to 60 days, um, is that you need to escrow all the PPP funds in, a, in an account held by the, the PPP lender. Um, and, you know, quite honestly, it, and then, then, so now everybody's stopping and saying, what does that escrow account need to look like? What, what are the terms of it? And I'll be honest, when I've, when I've been dealing with sellers that um, got their PPP loan from maybe a smaller regional bank, those banks are much more nimble. They're willing to be um, accommodating and get things done um, and not getting too much in the process. And when you get into bigger, more national banks, you know, we're getting 10 and 15 page escrow agreements governing this kind of thing and 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 documentation again saying that you've complied with all the SB, you know, they want reaffirmations that everything's been um, that all the laws have been complied for in the application and the spending of the money. And, and so um, it, it's been kind of across the board, but um, it, at least we have a framework before everybody before was trying to do a little bit of guessing on how you should um, how you should structure a deal, and this has provided a lot more certainty, which necessarily means speed at the end of the day, and more willingness to get a deal done. Steve, let's, let's talk a little about reps and warranties and indemnification. Um, are you seeing uh, the buyers spend more time uh, in require um, stronger reps and warranties and indemnification obligations to protect? for uh, or from COVID-related claims? Yes, yeah, I mean, it's certainly, a, you know, a, a new hot button and, and takes more time to negotiate through, uh, you know, pretty much every deal we've closed in the past three years has had rep and warranty insurance and, and we, we expect to continue going that route. We're starting to get some pushback from some private equity firms that, that have tried to make claims against rep and warranty insurance and a lot of the carriers are, are willing to to drag that out and and, and sort of litigate and, and and it's make it's making the product uh, problematic for some for some groups that have tried to to uh to, to utilize it but uh it's certainly a, a point that continues to get negotiated and, and and certainly i would say add some time between the lawyers to to, to figure that out chris uh any of these terms uh are you guys taking a different perspective with reps and warranties or indemnification obligations, your definitions of fundamental reps, for example? Well, again, I think given the nature of the way these transactions typically occur, not-for-profit to not-for-profit member substitution, uh, at, at one level, reps and warranties and indemnification honestly in my mind don't really mean a whole lot because once you come together um there's really no party to look to to uh to make a claim against on those reps and warranties and indemnification um and i haven't seen in the past uh much activity in the in the in the area of rep and warranty insurance being pursued although i think that is an available option I think for me, the, the, the thing that is likely to change is um, the due diligence is going to be um, required or a different kind of due diligence is going to be required 
um, given the significant uh, uh, dollars that have been infused into hospitals all over this country as a, as well, as a result of the CARES Act um, and, and um, getting a, a degree of comfort that um, the parties uh, involved in the transaction are going to be able to uh, withstand the, the audit that's going to come for those funds to, for the organization to be able to demonstrate to the satisfaction of, of the federal government that those funds have been applied in the manner for which they were intended. So I think that that's a new kind of due diligence and a whole new area that we historically obviously haven't had to uh, even think about really. So that that's certainly going to be a change. And how that finds its way into the definitive written agreement, uh, I think is going to be another interesting twist, if you will, from from what we've gone through in the last last year. Definitely. Uh, I know in my own experience, we're, we're spending a fair amount of time um, on those points. And this is a nice transition to, to Kirsten. Uh, to discuss uh, the rep and warranties, how they're changing to deal with the provider relief funds that uh, providers are receiving or the PPP loans. Um, and then lastly, how the, the providers, the sellers are complying with uh, local, state, and, and national COVID guidelines and, and new rules that are being issued. Um, tell us a little bit uh, about your experience with those issues, Kirsten. Yeah, and just to build a little bit on what Chris said, this whole this whole uncharted waters of the CARES Act funds and the provider relief funds. I mean, trying to get your hands around how confirming that the, the monies have been properly spent, and then and then confirming that the the parties have adequate um, systems in place to to facilitate audit have have been is something that, that people are trying to get their head around, especially since the guidance out there is constantly changing and it, it's becoming difficult. With respect to, to COVID, I'm gonna put all of this kind of in a basket, COVID issues, whether it's CARES Act funding or PPP loans or, or compliance with CDC guidance, I'm seeing um, a lot of buyers really putting the onus on the sellers saying, you know, this is this is your responsibility. We're really not willing to, to take on your liability for things that have gone on prior to that. And you're seeing those really being dollar one um, unlimited reps. If, if the if the SBA comes back and audits you and comply and, and um, finds out that you weren't initially eligible for this loan, you're going to you're going to pay the whole amount. And there's there, there's really been, not been a lot of negotiation or, or sharing of that. I've also seen, in, in respect to both the PPP and the CARES Act, private equity shying away from both of them, um, saying, you know, we're, we're not going to invest in providers that, that, that have taken CARES Act funding because it's, it's so uncertain right now and, and really backing away. Um, and similarly, in, in the, the PPP context, saying, listen, you need to pay off that loan. We don't want to go through the forgiveness process. We don't want to go through the SBA scrutiny, especially a lot of private equities have, um, you know, a target on their back because the, the, the government really wanted to make sure that they weren't getting the PPP funds. So it, it's put a, it, all these new issues have put unique conversations onto deals that, that have been interesting and, and, and fun to explore. And in my experience, Christian, that, that's translating into higher caps, lower baskets. Um, yeah, dollar uh, one, as I said. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And on the rep and warranty insurance, my experience has been uh, that uh, the parties are less um, interested in using rep and warranty insurance uh, because of the scrutiny that just the time it takes for the carrier to get all the information to make a decision. And then once they get all the information, they want to exclude uh, so much uh, the, the, the cost of going through that exercise and what they ultimately end up agreeing to cover. It just isn't worth um, the effort. Is that is that what you're seeing too? Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, our, our discussion, everyone, uh, has been intended to tease out how the pandemic is impacting uh, the process and the deal terms and the issues. 
during during the pandemic. And, and I think we've done that uh, well with the help of Steve, Chris, and uh, Kirsten. Um, I, what, I'd, what I'd like to spend some time with here in the last few minutes um, are what advice you're giving your, your clients that might be a, a little unique um, because of uh, uh, these, these transactions occurring in the pandemic. Um, and so starting with you, Steve, what, is there anything changing about how you're advising your clients or what you would share with the audience um, when it comes to trying to do a deal during a pandemic? I don't think anything, anything's changed in that, you know, we're always listening and understanding the motivations of what's driving a potential transaction, but we are advising doing more work up front before going to market, just given the, the complexities of this environment. And so there's a lot more um, compliance that needs to be in place with HIPAA and people working virtually and, and, and really making sure that PHI is, is in control and, and that you're not losing um, you know, your, your compliance rigor because of the, the environment that we find ourselves in. And so prepare, preparing from a compliance review to a quality of earnings review to, to really, you know, uh, parse through all of these programs for, from the SBA and, and from the government, as well as thinking through and being very thoughtful around making the adjustments for, for the, the sort of uh, lockdown COVID period and, and seeing what happens with, with, with all these flare-ups and a potential second wave. If you're not in a rush to do a deal, then let's, let's make sure that everything is buttoned up so when we go to market, there are, there's a you know, very low risk that there, there's something in your books or in your business that, that we did not see by, by really preparing. So it really comes down to listening to, to what the motivations are and then doing a lot more work up front to make sure everything's buttoned up so when we do go live, you know, we, we can run a very efficient pro process to maximize the outcome for our clients. Chris, how about on your side? Yeah, I, I think I alluded to it a moment ago. I, I, first of all, I think merger and acquisition activity, hospital system to hospital system will, will continue. I mentioned earlier that I think scale, pand the pandemic has certainly um, shown us that, that scale can be important. And so I think that's going to cause uh, organizations to continue to look at opportunities for uh, achieving that scale. Um, uh, but I think due diligence is going to take on a different character. So yes, there's the cyber risk. In fact, just this morning, we're, we're being inundated with emails about uh, a credible threat to uh, ransomware attacks this weekend directed right at the healthcare industry uh supposedly going to happen this weekend so we're lots of people are running around here trying to uh position us to be able to hopefully fend that off in the event that that intelligence turns out to be accurate i think the telemedicine front is an interesting front too because while um that became something that but we, we responded too quickly and there were waivers that allowed us to respond to that quickly and it's been reimbursed. It's, it's an open question for me at least to what extent that reimbursement will hold once we've emerged from this public health crisis. And I also think from a regulatory perspective, it's an area that is going to draw a lot of attention because I think there's going to be a, a predisposition that it's, um, it's, it's open to lots of abuse. Uh, I think we've already seen some enforcement activity in that area. Um, and then um, earlier I made a reference to how our, we've changed our view of kind of just-in-time inventory. Um, and while we do have a GPO that we've relied on for a lot of procurement, um, COVID caused us to go outside of our normal channels of procurement. It wasn't quite at the level of meeting somebody in a back alley and buying things out of a trunk of a car. but but we certainly went into some non-traditional sources. So um, I think that's an area uh, for examination and due diligence as well. And then lastly, we talked about, or I mentioned earlier, just the, uh, the getting satisfaction and comfort that the organizations can, are, are well positioned to respond to um, a section 133 grant audit from the federal government to demonstrate that CARES Act funds have been um, applied appropriately. Thank you, Chris. Um, Kirsten, how about a, a few minutes from you on advice you're, you're giving your clients? 
Yeah, I'm spending a lot more time really you know, counseling clients, trying to box risks, identify risks, um, especially in some of these uncharted waters where you don't really know what is going to be happening, such as the CARES Act funding, um, helping them think through what what the the organization will look like on a on a post transaction basis. I think people are being a lot more thoughtful and circumspect. I don't think it's stopping people from doing deals, but I think people are approaching them um, with a lot more focus on downside risk protection, making sure that they understand what they're getting into. Um, with respect to all of that. So that, that's, that's probably what I've been doing a lot more than, than historically is just be, before you'd spend a lot of time on the financial deals or just transacting the, the, the deal to make sure it got done at, in an appropriate time. And, and now I'm spending a lot more time with, with clients on the front end, like Steve said, just talking through all the issues. What do we need to be looking at, whether it's from a financial perspective or a legal perspective? Um, to make sure that the, the deal is is well thought out and so that it's transacted appropriately. Thank you, Kirsten. Uh, we, we've been answering a few of these questions. I've been weaving them into the discussion. I, I just want to um, uh, mention uh, or tie one into what Steve, I think you said. Uh, one of the questions was uh, based on uh, some guidance uh, being that uh, COVID may not uh, get a, come you know manageable into 2022 does that give us some pause around deal making and, and i heard you say if people uh, aren't uh, if it's not necessary to do a deal right now then you know pump the brakes let's see how this goes and it is a state by state or market by market uh, decision um uh, in in what may uh, uh, be bad timing for one market may be good timing for another um, I'll close with one uh, last question regarding the hospice and palliative care space. Um, this person says, we've certainly learned many new ways of operating through COVID-19 and found new efficiencies. Hospice is highly competitive. And with the struggles of SNFs and NIFs, I suspect there will be opportunity for significant consolidation. Do you have any specific advice or experience you might share related to this? Steve, you wanna answer that one? If you have anything to add there? I would say the post-acute world is, is is one that is very much in focus. I think there's a lot of questions around the long-term census implications of COVID in, in skilled nursing facilities, given that's where a lot of the deaths have been happening. And so we're seeing a heightened activity across home health, home care, personal care, and, and hospice as well. I think there was two uh, very large hospice trades recently where um, the first private equity dollars that came into these hospices, in some cases, the second private equity group that invested in these hospices has since exited to another larger group. And the valuations for, you know, a good hospice business that has a census, you know, pushing a thousand is is in the mid teens of EBITDA, which is which is extremely attractive in, the, in this time. And so, um, if, you know, I would say I would hospice and post acute will will continue to be at the forefront of of, of buyer and investor interest going forward. Thank you, Steve. Um, Chris, Steve, Kirsten, I uh, greatly appreciate your, your insights today and participating on our panel. We have come to the end of our session. Uh, I wanna thank everyone in the audience for joining today. Uh, we hope the information was helpful to you and your organization. As a reminder, please join us next Thursday for session six, Stimulus Relief Funds, Strings Attached. This program has been approved, as I mentioned earlier, for legal education hours. Um, keep an eye out for your certificate um, after you go to CEU icon at the bottom of the screen. Uh, and please, 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 we would love your feedback. We value your feedback. Um, please complete our short survey at the end. Uh, so we can uh, continue delivering the, the kind of program that will be most helpful. This concludes our webinar. Um, thank you very much and take care.